John Kaiser, as you presumably all know. The title's kind of strange. What does a sudden low tide mean? And uh, any, everybody, anybody out there can guess what that means is coming? That's right. So we had a six-year bear market that started in 2011, and uh, we had an unusual turnaround last year, half-decent start in uh, the first quarter, but then everything has faded. The traded value has fallen off. Uh, the traded uh, volume has fallen off. Uh, uh, indices have sort of remained flat, but uh, the resource juniors have kind of really stalled this year. It feels almost as if we are back in a bear market. And that's why I, I, so I said, but it isn't. We are not. We are actually in the early parts of what's going to be a phenomenal bull market for the resource sector, for the juniors in particular. Um, so why are things stalled? Um, well, everybody's afraid that the senior equity markets, uh, which are record highs, are, are going to uh, collapse. Uh, the volatility index is uh, really, really low, which frightens everybody, says, oh boy, that means uh, things are going to get bad really soon. And of course, we know the resource juniors always get crunched. And then there's new bubbles like uh, uh, Bitcoin, cannabis, and that, uh, which are capturing the, uh, the hot money's attention. Uh, and against all this backdrop, risk appetite is growing. So why are we not benefiting from it in the extent that we have in past cycles. Financing activity so far this year has been surprisingly good. 2.7 billion uh, raised by venture listed resource companies uh, as of September 30th compared to 2.6 billion for all of last year. But when you look at the numbers, it's still pretty grim. Only about 37% uh, of the TSX Venture Resource Juniors that are on my website have more than a half million dollars in the treasury. The, these ones uh, have about 2.7 billion, 2.6 billion working capital. But the other uh, two thirds of the companies, uh, they owe 2.7 billion, many of them uh, below 10 cents. So the audience out there that has owned these things in the past is still hurting, has not really seen the benefits of the turnaround in the sector. So uh, it's also been quite selective. It's gone into a relatively small number of companies. Now, copper has done really well. Um, gold has done uh, pretty good. Uh, zinc's done very well. Um, nickel's been a bit of a laggard. Uh, uh, cobalt's up because we have new demand driving it, or at least the potential for new demand from uh, the electric vehicle market, uh, the cobalt cathode portion of the lithium ion battery. We, we have seen better global GDP growth than one might have expected, but there is this backdrop that uh, the direction Donald Trump wants to take the United States is harmful to itself, is harmful to the rest of the world, so there's a concern that you know things could end uh, very quickly, and we go back into some major market decline, another full-blown financial crisis. Um, at the same time, China just keeps motoring along. Xi Jinping has just crowned himself on a par with uh, Mao Zedong as a, you know, a, a leader whose uh, sayings are now enshrined in uh, whatever uh, constitution that they have. But he's also doing things like uh, uh, seriously cracking down on pollution. And that's going to uh, curtail supply of a lot of metals in which China dominates. They're also cracking down on corruption, which goes hand in hand with uh, pollution. It's not as though China doesn't have uh, pollution laws. Uh, it's just the uh, lack of enforcement of them uh, that's a problem. And of course, uh, they, they have embraced the electric car future. They are charging ahead. They sense that America is fading away from the global stage. They're ready to take their place. They're expanding their military footprint. And, and yet everybody's very complacent. Uh, uh, why are they complacent about Donald Trump? And the thing is, everybody kind of understands that all these policies that he's pushing that supposedly uh, 
will make America great again, is nonsense. Like here we have two individuals and two nations. One of them has a greatness that the other doesn't have and wants. So one of them, they all call him dear leader. Is this what America wants? We know who does want it. One of them has a real no-nonsense haircut. The other has such a strange haircut that he had to turn his plane helicopter around because the rain at the demilitarized zone was going to make it wet and have it droop into his face. I mean, <laughs> one of these countries has a wall that nobody crosses. One of these countries has no immigrants. Nobody wants to go there. One of these companies has an excellent judicial system that does exactly what dear leader wants it to do. One of these countries has no fake news whatsoever. It's all true. There's only one set of news and it's true. One country has no arguments about whether the focus should be on butter versus guns. Guns clearly get the focus. One country has only one obese citizen. <laughs> one country has no trade deficit because nobody is allowed to trade with them. <laughs> and in one country, nobody worries about the personal business affairs of the leader. And there's no environmental opposition to anything in that country. Oddly, this country has universal health care. And it's interesting, Trump actually is not for the Republican view of uh, let's have no health care for people uh, except those who can afford for it. It's always his repeal and replace. He wants to have universal health care too in the United States. In one country, no critical thinking is taught whatsoever. And where, what kind of policy uh, in the education system uh, uh, desires that? And one country has no ban on assassinations. You know, somebody annoys them, they go and kill them, even if it's a half-brother. And uh, one country knows an awful lot more about the other. And that isn't the United States. The best hackers in the world are in this country. And in this country, if you call dear leader a moron, you don't just get in front of a tweet firing squad, you get in front of a real one. And uh, this country respects science and knows not to look at, an e at the sun during an eclipse. <laughs> so I've done this as a kind of a, a farcical thing to sort of illustrate that uh, a lot of these, the trends of these policies are pushing towards thing things that North Korea already has and which even Trump followers don't want. So I think Trump is going to be a passing phenomenon and this anxiety about everything falling apart is probably misplaced. Yes, all these pushes and calls for these improvements are, that supposedly will make America great are there, but eventually they will fade and the United States will continue to be a strong, stable player on the global scale. Now that's not so good for gold, because right now we don't have a, a serious inflation threat to make it go higher. In fact, the gold price today is a $400 gold in 1980 adjusted to the present, so in real price terms, uh, there hasn't been much of a gain. Um, the optionality story has become kind of kind of lame itself. Uh, you know, we, we hear of three three thousand dollar gold, and nobody ever comes up with a good explanation as to uh, uh, why uh, why this would happen in real price terms. Uh, if it's just because the currency declines or because of there's inflation, well, that doesn't make a marginal deposit any better at three thousand dollar gold than it does today. But the one argument that uh, does make sense for higher real gold prices is the possibility that Trump will succeed in making America great 
in these unfortunate terms that I just described in the prior slide. And that really bodes ill for the future. There would come an interregnum of uncertainty where the US dollar uh, becomes unstable as the world's reserve currency, where there is an extraordinary demand for an alternative place to park one's wealth. And of course, gold should be the obvious beneficiary. So a higher real price for gold should be on the table, but we're not seeing the real price increases, again, because I don't think the world believes all these things that Trump wants to make happen will actually happen. Now, there's another reason to think that uh, real gold prices are not going to go up in the long term, and that's because what I think has been discovered in the Pilbara Craton of uh, Western Australia is perhaps an order of magnitude bigger than what was found in South Africa in um, 1875 or whenever, whenever it was. You can see in that chart there, the blue is South Africa's supply dominating the uh, last sort of 60, 70 years until they finally get so deep that the cost of mining this gold, which has a pretty consistent grade, I believe it averages 11 grams per ton, it just gets too hot and dangerous to access it down at 4,000. Meters. And so they churned out 1.6 billion ounces over the past uh, 100 years, and they still have a billion ounces left, and possibly more if you go deeper into the basin. But what I think is going to happen as the WITS 2.0 hypothesis gets confirmed is there's going to be a tremendous increase of interest in gold. And all this fear you might have of, of gold flooding the market, that's not realistic. There's 96 million ounces of new gold churned out every year. It would be a long time before there's even 10 million ounces a year coming out from the Pilbara. So in terms of uh, the Pilbara affecting the gold price negatively, I think that's quite a ways down the road. But in the long run, the Pilbara will end up becoming the big, giant gold mine of the world. And I believe that it's the confirmation that this is a reality, not just this crazy thing people like Kaiser talk about, um, is going to be recognized. And that's going to unleash the tsunami of interest in the resource sector. And the thing is, um, this will become like a giant real estate development play, where once they get this idea that it is similar to the wits 1.0, but different, and they have a reliable method of measuring it. It just becomes a question of drilling the holes down, assessing it, and then putting in the capex to mine this gold. And that will tap into a much broader pool of capital than right now the exploration industry does, which is either for a, um, you know, optionality plays or old-fashioned discovery exploration, both of which are viewed to be very high risk. So this tsunami, which I also call the Briex Redemption, because this one is not going to be based on fakery, it is still possible that the average grade ends up being lower than needed to mine. But the driver behind this is Quinton Henney through his Novo Resources Corp, who realized what has been sort of staring everybody in the face for maybe 50 to 80 years, that this is, some, this is what he's been looking for all along. This is something very special, and it's also different from the WITS, and yet it's related to it. So what is the WITS 2.0 hypothesis? And keep in mind, it is still just a hypothesis. So all of this stuff could still evaporate on us. It is still a very high-risk play. The first hypothesis is that this gold in these beds will average five grams per ton or higher over large laterally extensive zones. The second is that a cost-effective and reliable protocol for assessing the grade and tonnage can be developed. Because if you can't overcome the nugget problem, uh, you're not going to be able to go down dip and assess the potential for a resource. The wits the nuggets are like 100 microns wide. That's the size of the width of two, double the width of a human hair. It's actually tiny, although it has a detrital nugget-like appearance 
that's under a microscope. So you can measure the wit's gold. So this second challenge is really the most important thing right now. How do we reliably measure this nuggety gold in these conglomerate beds? And the third part of the hypothesis, and this is where things get really interesting and exciting, is the scientific part. Where did this gold come from? And one reason the Australians uh, never really figured out that this stuff, all these nuggets they've been finding in that region, come from this conglomerate bed is because they've been hooked on the interpretation for the Witwatersrand Reef that basically this is all originally bedrock hosted hydrothermally driven gold uh, eroded from the uplands, uh, transported through the river system into the basins and then sort of reworked, maybe remobilized and all that. But it all came from a higher up upland host, hosted source and, uh, and, and, and that's why it's sort of all over the place. But none of that really makes sense because you would have had to have a forest of gold deposits uh, instantly shaved down and deposited in a very narrow window of time, which just isn't feasible. So the theory that Quinton Haney and his associates have been pushing is that, in fact, after three and a half billion years ago, uh, uh, the, the atmosphere and the water, the, the hydrosphere, the oceans, had a very different chemistry than they did today. A lot of hydrogen sulfide, uh, a chemistry that allows a lot of metals to dissolve in it to a degree where I've heard that uh, there's four orders of magnitude more gold was dissolved in seawater than it is today. So uh, the, the idea is that when life began to flourish and formed a form of photosynthesis that created oxygen, the oxygen bubbling up from these reefs or, or these mats in the shallows of the uh, uh, continental shelf, uh, it would scavenge the gold that was attached to the bisulfide uh, complex, kick it out, take its place, and form some sort of sulfate. And the gold had to go somewhere. It can't stay in solution by itself. So that's the precipitation thing. It finds a substrate itself. It's the best substrate. It nucleates, and so you have this period of where the gold gra uh, grains are literally growing and twice a day the tide comes in, brings a whole batch of water that's freshly loaded at the ocean's uh, high gold solubility. You have the, uh, the mats uh, uh, you know, not doing photosynthesis at night when there's no, no sunlight. And then you have this reworking all the time. And so you have over a huge area the same conditions forming these little gold nuggets. And, uh, because this is much closer to the shore than what we see in the Wits, which is much farther down shore, this is very different. This is why we have these bigger nuggets. They can't possibly have come from little deposits up in the, uh, up in the mountains uh, on the land. Now, if this is all true, what we have here is something that's preserved, that's nowhere else preserved in the world. In the Wits, the nearshore portion is missing. It's gone. Here it seems to be largely preserved. And this is now coming to light, which is why this idea that there's not like a billion ounces here, but maybe 20 billion ounces to be harvested over a huge area of like 100,000 square kilometers that is basically staked wall to wall right now. Uh, Nova only has 10% 10, 10 of it. Uh, iron companies own a huge chunk. Uh, all of a sudden, there's something potentially there that's everywhere, and all it will take is capital to prove it's there and then mine it. And when that starts to happen, we'll have an extraordinary bull market uh, for the resource sector. Now, this presentation is going to be uh, online. It's also going to be a video. So I just have some graphics here illustrating these ideas of the, uh, you know, the, the changing solubility. Uh, Today, the solubility of gold in seawater is much lower. You do not have the precipitation phenomenon. But during that magic window, 2.9 to 2.7 billion years ago, that's when the gold solubility was high. That's when oxygen was just starting to come. Uh, it was not yet uh, like 2.4 billion years ago where the oxygen event caused the iron to suddenly drop out as rust 
into the ocean floors, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden the world forever changed towards what is ultimately its current state. So what is happening with the uh, measurement task? So right now, Artemis and Novo have the Purdy's Reward Project, where they've opened up these trenches along the daylighting portion of these conglomerate beds. You can see in this uh, lower part here, this is sort of a, a snapshot of what it looks like. And then higher up, you have uh, other layers uh, farther, farther down slope. Um, in early August, they released results from a bulk sample, mini bulk sample, 542 kilos taken from one small pit. It ran over 60 grams, 67 grams per ton gold, over two ounces, like phenomenal, like not believable. But in there was a nine gram per ton uh, fine gold component that was basically measured by assay and calculation. And that opened the possibility that maybe there's a systemic background level of gold within these conglomerate beds that can be picked up by small diameter drilling. Now, Novo right now is pursuing a kimberlite style sampling program of large diameter, 17 and a half inch holes, go down to the target depth, take the uh, conglomerate bed and then process it. Basically, it's like total total rock processing, just like you do for diamonds with, uh, with a, um, a kimberlite pipe. Um, the problem is uh, um, that's very expensive when you get deep. If you're down 300 meters, 1,000 meters, you're not going to push a 17 and a half inch wide drill through 1,000 meters. I mean, you blow your brains out with costs that might not even be physically feasible to do that. So right now, the question is, if it's possible to develop a small diameter way of measuring a baseline gold content and then maybe other marker metals or things in it uh, uh, that tell you that there's going to be a nugget gold also, you will have the, a, a tool where companies can just start drilling off to see where are the beds, how thick are they, what's in there as a baseline. Is it interesting enough to justify sinking a shaft and bulk sampling it in the traditional, in the traditional manner? So that's all underway now. We may not know anything until January. However, they've uh, taken at least uh, 30 uh, drums full of half, half ton to one ton sample that are waiting to be transported to the Nagram facility where they use that Steinart machine to process it. If What we want to see is how does the fine gold behave in each one of those and the nugget gold? And, and the biggest question, of course, is what is the grade, the average grade, going to be for this? So this is where all the action is. This is now the R&D workshop for the entire play. The work Artemis and Novo are doing there will tell us whether the WITS 2.0 hypothesis uh, has has legs. And we won't really find out about how laterally extensive it is, though the gray has uh, its uh, Loudon's patch, which looks exactly like this, spills the same sort of watermelon seed shaped and, uh, uh, and, and sized uh, nuggets out of it. So we already have uh, anecdotal evidence that what's here is over a vast region. But how do you price a junior like that? Uh, you know, I didn't do anything when it was at a nickel, even though I knew this company would benefit very well. Um, I did finally recommend it at 25 cents, uh, and it's uh, hit, uh, that's 25 cent uh, uh, US, I mean Australian, and it's uh, like uh, over 50 cents today. Uh, they put out some very significant news, which turns them from being son of Novo to a sibling of Novo. And, uh, it was this little claim down here, which is all this red stuff, which they announced last night in the last 15 minutes or so of trading, which completely changes it because this is basically the same stuff as this. All the glomerant beds dip this way. Now they have operatorship of their own stuff, a 70% interest, and they can on their own dime and decisions pursue alternative uh, methods of assessing this stuff. So Artemis. I've got a dollar target on it. Uh, it has now the potential to overshoot that. But again, why a dollar? Why, why not like uh, 20 cents or, or, or $5 or $10? Well, 
what I've done is an outcome visualization. I've taken that little triangle of Purdy's reward and sort of said, okay, if it's five meters thick, uh, it'll be about 80 million tons of material there. I've run a simplified discounted cash flow analysis on that using a 15,000 ton per day underground mining scenario, so 80 million tons. And then I've kind of arbitrarily plugged in 10 grams per ton. And the discount rate's pretty vicious. It's 14.5% because of all the risks of technical risks and that associated with it. That's like a $5.4 billion US after-tax uh, NPV, which if you assume no further dilution, that's almost a $5 target for the company. Now that's of course not where it should be because uh, fair value, it's still at discovery delineation. We haven't proven all these things, but this is what the market does. The market visualizes potential outcomes, says this is the size of the prize, what stage are we at? Well, the, the uncertainty is still like 95% or more, so we'll price it at that. But now we have what's called a, the S-curve activity, and that's the yellow here. This is S-curve. This is why discovery exploration is so much more fun than optionality gambling. Uh, the, this, this is the, the stock could go to what it might be worth at the end of the day well before we have the information in hand that justifies that. And the reason this happens is because different people can put in different grade scenarios. I've done this through the share collective and done different scenarios using the same cost structure assumptions. If the average grade is two grams per ton, game over. Bill Bear is dead. Maybe there'll be higher grade pockets here and there, but the, the amount of money needed to find those particular ones uh, you know, might not end up being there. On the other hand, if you go to the other extreme, 60 grams per ton, which is that grade of that first data point, um, you get an insane value of $30 billion U.S. for that scenario. You know, 80 million tons of, of, uh, of, of, of 60 gram, uh, that's what, 160 million ounces in one deposit that you could conceivably mine in 20 years. And imagine if the entire WITS 2.0 hypothesis is correct and you have dozens of such mines springing up over the next 10 years. That's the dream out there. We have no idea what the grade is going to be for any mineable tonnage. That's the big uncertainty, but that's also the dream. And where do you want to be? You want to be inside this yellow stuff. You do not want to be where the basement rocks are exposed because the uh, Mount Row, this here covers the conglomerates that sit between the older basement and the Mount Row, which is just under 2.8 billion. So all the action seems to have happened somewhere between 2.9 and 2.8 billion years ago. And you can sort of see, this is what everybody's tracking here. Now, people talk about this being mapped, but who cares? It's just the edge. This, most of this exists all the way and it curves up down in the south here again. So if the WITS 2.0 hypothesis is correct, and all of this was underwater and gold was precipitating everywhere, we have an extraordinary gold rush happening, especially since all of this is owned. And I, if you go to my website, you'll find something called the Pilbara uh, WITS 2.0 Resource Center. I'm now tracking all the companies that I know have land in there, uh, all the news releases. It's your gateway. Go there. It's unrestricted. Uh, I'm adding stuff all the time to it. Now, here's the other thing. Um, with this type of play, if we have grades of five grams or better, who cares about gold going up? Gold going to 2,500 in real price terms, which, is, which will make optionality plays go up 10, 20 times, only doubles the value of the scenario that I've sp uh, spelled out here at, uh, at, uh, at the current spot price. So this type of play immunizes us from having to fret about where gold is going, even if it goes down to a thousand bucks, who cares? This type of play is going to uh, work even at a thousand dollar gold, assuming the grades are there. Now, does this mean you should give up on all the other juniors out there and just focus on the Pilbara? The Pilbara is not going to, going to uh, uh, deliver itself overnight. It's going to be a 10-year 
gold rush, a lot of capital going in, a lot of money will be made. It will stimulate interest in gold in general. It will also give people this idea, gold's going nowhere on the upside. So if you want to make money in this space, put money into exploration for discoveries that work. And the Pilbara is not going to be the only place where you make discoveries, and it's not going to be 10 grams or 5 grams uh, wall to wall. I mean, the sorting of the tides and all that will localize stuff. It's, still, it's, it's not going to be so simple that you just put straws in there and suck it out like an oil, oil well type of thing. So the companies, the other four companies in my group are, um, one of them is VR Resources. Bonita project, major copper system in Nevada, a recent new bottom fish pick. Another one is crystal exploration, which is twinning tracks, uh, diamond exploration and gold exploration in the north slave of uh, Canada's Northwest Territories. Um, then there is Alto Ventures, which is uh, looking at one of the, well, probably the least explored greenstone belt in the Canadian Shield, which has all the ingredients for being just like the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, and all you need is capital. Companies like this will benefit when this tsunami of capital comes in and people make money and they start recycling and certain plays get too expensive. This Pilbara thing is going to be the engine that drives the discovery exploration tsunami that's coming. And then, of course, Mineral Mountain, which is set to start drilling uh, uh, as soon as they wrap up their $3 million financing to look for another home stake, pretty much in the backyard of the original home stake in South Dakota. A lot of signs going into it, a lot more money required, no $200,000 kill shots, has to be big programs. There's many companies like that. Uh, Artemis and these four are the ones featured uh, in, in my session that are current recommendations on my part. But a lot of the companies out there are going to benefit and it's really a good time to do your homework now while that tide still seems to be bizarrely pulling out when it should be driving things higher because this is the prelude to an extraordinary tsunami that's going to come. Thank you. <laughs>